So, and we're going to try to go live on Facebook. Let's see if this works. You got it, Rebecca. There we go. I hit Facebook Live. Are we live streaming? Oh, it's gonna just tell me this, all this stuff. If you could please let me know if it's going live on Facebook because- um, You're good, it's, it's live, good. you got it. Yes, okay, we're good. All right, excellent. <laughs> Charlie could breathe a sigh of relief. But... I was able to get this done. All right, excellent. So I want to welcome you all to um, the portion. This Friday is going to be an exciting one um, because there's a lot of meat. There's a lot of stuff that we can talk about. And I think a lot of things that we can glean for our own lives. And um, so we're just going to jump right in because there's a lot of stuff going on. So um, if you know the portion, um, this week's portion is El, uh, Vaira which is, um, and he came, right? And, um, or he appeared to him, right? And so it's found in Genesis 18, one to Genesis 22, 24. And um, let's just get started. So it says that, that we find um, the scene opens up and it says that Abraham is sitting in the entrance of his tent next to some large trees during the heat of the day. And he lifts up his eyes and he suddenly sees three men right by him. And when he sees these men, it says um, he runs from the entrance of his tent to meet him and bound down to the ground. And my mom pointed something out to me that I thought was pretty interesting. And maybe yeah. you want to share that. Yeah, I wanted to share that. Our Bible is divided into chapters and verses. The Hebrew Bible is not. If we would have continued reading, the, the, uh, the verse prior said, says and every male in abraham's household including those born in his household or bought from a foreigner was circumcised with him and the verse before 24 abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his son ishmael was 13. abraham and his son ishmael were both circumcised on that same day so he's in the period of recovery and i understand that is very painful we uh, learned from the story of uh, Levi and his brother when they went to um, fight for his sister, Dina. They asked all the guys in that um, village to get circumcised and they were able to overcome them, the two of them, because they were in pain. So let's not forget that, that even though he's in pain, his concept of hospitality is so ingrained in him that he did what he did. He ran to meet them. Right. So it shows the intention, the intention of what was on his heart. If we could, if we could just kind of um, speculate, because really we don't know if it happened right after, if it was a continuation. We do know that, but but it does show that his heart was there, where he was intent. the The idea of hospitality, which is going to play out throughout this portion, was very important to him. Okay. And so now um, when it comes, when, when it all happens, he says, look, if I found favor in your eyes, please don't just leave. Let me serve you something to um, kind of relieve you from this heat and rest a while. And then you can carry on in your journey. And so one thing that I always like to point out um, when I'm looking at scripture and I'm reading these stories is the fact of the, the factor that time plays when we're when we're reading because it's so quick for us to read i'm always amazed when i put a chapter to listen to uh like audibly for um the apps to play it for me while i'm doing something or when we're listening to the portions that 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 um so many of us here on here on on the rooted cafe it's it's literally a couple of minutes you know four or five minutes and they'll read the portion to us or you know at most 10 minutes let's put you know at most minutes but in those 10 minutes, you have the spans of decades sometimes of a person's life and everything that they're going through, you know? So we have Abraham that is just beginning this journey of walking with God. He's trying, and, and, and God takes this time to allow 
Abraham and Sarah, but Abraham particularly, to know who he is, right? And we see this play out later with his children when they come out of Egypt, right? They spend 40 years in the desert. It's all this time that's needed for them to get to know who God is so that they can place, they can confidently place, place their trust in him because they know that what he says that he will do, he will do, right? And Rebecca, so- Rebecca, one thing is that we cannot overemphasize the, the, the concept of hospitality. It's gonna play out throughout the, the, the different chapters that we're gonna to read today. It is so important in that culture so that's why it, it, it's, he says, if I have found a favor in your eyes, verse three, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Like he's begging them to stay with him, to uh, be able to serve them. That, that is something so foreign to us many times, you know, begging people right. to stay and, and share a meal. Right, right, exactly. I don't know what happened to the pin, but um, if... if Tish, if you know what happened, if you could just help me out and, and pin um, my mom so we can get her back up here. But right, it's 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 um, if you could just repeat that one more time. That the concept of hospitality is so ingrained in the Middle Eastern culture that he's he's begging people, although he's in pain, assuming that you know he's in the peri right. period of uh, recovery from his circumcision, he's begging them to stay and to share a meal. And when we've been to Israel, whether they're Arabs or Jewish people, they're really welcome you in, in, in their homes. It's something really nice. When, when I spent time in Morocco and I would sit down for a meal after a big meal and, and the, the word that I kept hearing over and over and over again was kol, kol, kol. That means like eat, 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 you know? And they would, they would put food in front of me And um, I wasn't used to eating so much. And, and after every meal, they would place a bowl of fruit out on the table. Um, and it would be bananas and strawberries and you know, just different kinds of fruit. And um, which we'll call it when I remember one time I took a strawberry from the bowl and the father of the household saw that I liked the strawberry and he took it upon himself for the entire rest of the time that we were there to sit there and cut off the tops of strawberries and place them in front of me as soon as I would eat one. And he would cut off another one and place it in front of me as a gesture of just his hospitality. He wanted me to keep eating. He saw that I liked it. And so he wanted me to keep eating it. As a matter of fact, when I left, when I was leaving, um, one of the people from the household went and to the market and bought a ton of fruit. They, he, they saw that I liked a certain type of melon, this big yellow melon that's delicious. They brought me a melon, they brought me mangoes, and they brought me a pineapple, they brought me all these fruits, and they placed them in front of me when I'm getting ready to leave. And I looked at them and I said, well, you know, what is this? And they're like, oh, so you can take it with you. And I said, I can't take that on the plane. <laughs> they won't let me bring it into the country. And they're like, what? And they're like, no, you, they won't, um, they won't let me bring it into the country. And we literally had to sit there and start cutting up a lot of the fruits that they wouldn't go to waste because they had bought too much, you know? And another thing that I remember when I was in Morocco was that every couple of days, the mother in the household would bake bread. And what she would do is she would take one of those, like, you know, when you're in a commercial kitchen and they have those sheet pans, she would take one of those sheet pans and she would make about six loaves of bread on there. And then we would have to take it and walk it down to the communal oven um, that was like literally um created inside of like the 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 stone like the ground they had like a brick oven that was in the ground and it was a communal oven and you would take your your sheet you know your sheet of a metal sheet of bread and you would take it there they would bake it for you and then you would bring it back home and when you would bring it back home you'd have bread for several days every time that we sat down to eat bread it was they would make it in these round loaves every time they would rip out you know they don't cut They kind of rip off pieces of bread and you would just sit there and eat. Every time that the meal ended, whatever was left over, they would place it in a little bag. And I, and one day I asked, I said, why do you place it in the bag? You know, what, what's that? What's that all about? There's these chunks of bread. And they said, oh, they hang it outside the door of the house. So that if somebody's walking by and they're hungry and they don't have money or they can't, you know, they can't get something to eat, they have access at least to bread to eat. And I remember one time um, listening to Nehemiah Borden, he was talking about that they went for a hike yes. 
And there were like these low, um, you know, they use these like low stone fences to kind of delineate um, land or where they block off for their livestock or et cetera, et cetera. And every so often you would see like just these little little chunks of bread or loaves of bread along the wall. And he asked about it. And, and the reason why he asked about it was he said, well, if somebody's on a journey and they're hungry, they don't have anything else, at least they have a piece of bread. So this idea, this concept of hospitality and of caring for your neighbor is huge in this culture, in this Middle Eastern culture, right? And we're going to see it play out and we're going to see the effects of it throughout this portion, okay? So right now we have Abraham. He may or may not be in pain, but regardless of that, in, you know, regardless of that, the intention of his heart is he's running out and saying, listen, you can't just walk by. I haven't given you bread. And so they sit down and we, we pay attention to the factor of time because he goes, it says that he goes into, um, it's funny. He says, let me bring you a bit of bread. But then he runs in and tells Sarah, Sarah, quick, make bread, you know, for them. So Sarah's quickly making bread. And then he says he hurries, uh, he ran and took a young, young ox, tender and good, and he gave it to the servant who prepared it quickly. So they're, they're really into this, right? They're intent on, on, on being able to provide sustenance and being able to provide well for the people. Because at, at, in the beginning, he says, you know, um, let me bring a bread, bit of bread so that you can refresh yourself so that you can then pass on. But then it's not just bread, right? He has to go above and beyond. And he goes and he prepares a meal for them, right? And, and in the next verse, in verse eight, it says, then he took butter and milk and the young ox that he had prepared and set it before them. Now, I'm not gonna go into really the idea of the rabbinical um, interpretation <laughs> interpretation about eating meat and milk or whatever. But what we see here specifically is that um, Abraham does not cook the, 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 the ox that he gets in milk, but he does provide milk and meat there together. So you, you do with that what you will. My interpretation, I can eat a cheeseburger, but that's my interpretation. <laughs> okay, so you do with that what you will. Okay, so we're going to go on, and he provides us food for them, and he comes, and it says, and they ate. And interestingly enough, it says um, that all of a sudden they said to him, well, where's Sarah, your wife? And he says, well, she's there in the tent. And the man that's there says, well, this time when I come next year, she's going to be holding a baby. And it says that Sarah laughs. And it's and it's and it's it's hard for for her to believe with everything that she's gone through and with something that she has desired for so long. And she has felt that her ship has passed, that now God is gonna answer and give her, you know, what her heart has desired for so long. And I just wanna encourage you, because sometimes there are things in our hearts. Nobody else knows them. Sometimes people know them. Sometimes people don't, you know, um, nobody else knows them. It was interesting because this week I read an article about Jennifer Aniston and she finally addressed the issue of not having children with Brad Pitt. And one of the things that she said that I found interesting was she said for so long, people thought that the reason why my marriage ended was because I wouldn't give Brad a child and that I was so selfish and so concerned about my career that I forewent having children so that I could continue on in my career. And she said, little did they know that I was going through IVF. I was drinking Chinese teeth. Anything that they told me to do to get pregnant, I was doing it. It just did not happen. That wasn't what, you know, that, was, that wasn't what the way things played out for me in my life. But everybody made assumptions and everybody made criticisms and kind of labeled her a certain way without knowing the facts. And so why do I bring this up? Because there may be something that's in your heart. There may be a desire. There may be something that you have been striving for and it just not has happened yet. And I want to encourage you because the Lord is in that. In the waiting and in the and in the and in the in that period of not having something, the Lord is in that. And, and if it's timing, in the Lord, and his time is, is perfect. If it is in his will for that to happen, and like my mom said, you know, that his timing is perfect. It can happen even when science and nature and everything else says that it shouldn't. 
And so I want to encourage you because sometimes we get to a point in life. Um, I know like I just turned 44 and I just became of an age where I realized that somebody asked me the other day how old I was and I said 42 and I wasn't trying to like <laughs> my age I simply forgot how old I was so I'm getting to that point where the you know the, the years are coming on and I, I just forgot and I said oh I'm 42 and I was like wait am I 42 and I had to count no 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 I'm 44 and sometimes I think and there have been these whispers that come into my ears that say well xyz thing that you want it's over with or it's not that ship has sailed that was that was a phrase that jennifer anderson used in her in her uh, interview she said that ship has sailed it didn't happen you know and sometimes i have felt that that ship has sailed sometimes you may have felt that ship has sailed well i just want to encourage you because in god's perfect timing if it is part of the plan the perfect plan that he has for us and god's word says that what he wants for us is <laughs> good good things he wants to you know give us good things his his idea for us is for us to prosper, for us to, you know, fulfill the plans that he has for us. And if that desire is in his plan, it will happen no matter what anybody else says. Okay. So we find Sarah and she's kind of laughing. She's like, whatever, this isn't going to happen. It can't happen. Physically, it can't happen. And, and, he, and he comes to her and he says, is anything too difficult for God? Is anything too difficult for God? Well, here we have a perfect example that we can kind of latch on to where nothing is impossible for God if it's in his plan. If he determines something to be so, it will be so. And you can take that to the bank, right? Now, Re Rebecca, I, I wanted to say now that we have access to social media and so much information around the world, we hear a lot more testimonies of people that have prayed for someone who has been actually dead and they come back to life because our God is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. So that's Amen. the kind of God that we serve. Amen. Amen. And so um, let's continue going, right? So this is the God that we serve. And what I find interesting here, we just talked about how important hospitality is. And I said it kind of plays out through this portion. We're now going to go into a situation that has been. Uh, talked about for a long time and there's different interpretations of what it is that it actually happens here etc cetera, etc cetera. but um, we're going into the situation with lot now if you'll remember a couple of verses back when lot and abraham are together prosperity begins to happen right god's hand is over them and they begin to grow and it gets to the point where they grow so much that the servants start to fight over where they're going to pasture their animals where they're going to get water it, it, it seems like the room is, is getting just a little bit tighter and they don't quite fit together. And so they make the determination. And it's interesting because Abraham has to make this determination. And it was a step of faith for him that I, I think we don't really recognize maybe. Because up until this point, you know, God has said that things will happen, but he hasn't seen it. And just like Sarah, years and years have passed on and he hasn't seen it. And at one point he tells God, listen, you know, you're saying all these things, but how am I supposed to have descendants and all this if I don't even have an heir? I don't have a child. I don't have a son. And if and everything is going to go to my servant, if you know, and and some have said this is just conjecture, but it you know, some have said that perhaps Abraham took Lot with him because Lot was his backup plan in case what this God who he was just getting to know didn't come through with what he promised. So if that were the case. When he comes together with Lot and they determine that, you know, it's not enough space for us. We kind of have to separate. This was a, a, a moment of faith for Abraham, too, because he's completely separating himself from his past. Rebecca, you know, God, I also want to point out something very important that is we don't see in our own culture is that the elders have a say in everything their first choice and Abraham that his, his kindness is showing that he's going to give him the first choice to lot you right. know when we have seen the the movies about it, actually in actuality even in Iraq and Iran and those places where still have tribal affiliations although when we dress like western people they still have that concept of the elders have the first say 
And here uh, I see uh, Abraham's kindness in giving Lot the, cho the first choice. Right, right. And so he comes and he says, listen, we're going to have to split up. You go your way and you can pick, like, like, like Sonia's pointing out, um, you can pick which way you want to go and I'm going to go the other way. And, and at that moment, because when God says, you know, come out of your land, remember the, what God speaks to him in the beginning, he says, come out of your land, come out of, of, of your people and everything. And I'm going to take you a place that I'm going to show you in, 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 um, in Spanish, there's a saying, tenía cola que le pisaba. He still had a, he, he had a, he had a tail that was coming behind him, you know? He, he still hadn't let go of everything completely because he brought Lot along with him. When they get to this point, it's at this point where Abraham has to say, it's all or nothing. And, I, and I'm okay with letting go completely of my past. And, and for me, this points to the fact that God is okay with us walking this out. When we make a determination to include him in our lives and make a commitment to him and say, God, I want to have a relationship with you and I want to um, follow the words that you're going to say, we can say that and mean it with all of our hearts. But we have culture we have language we have tradition we have all these things that we're coming the baggage that we're our experience that that we've had so far in life we come along with that and oftentimes those things need to be stripped away to make room for what god has for us but it takes time and so i just want to reiterate how how much time plays a factor here so in this journey he's been journeying with god he gets to the point where it's like the last thing that he has to strip off comes off when he separates from lot and, and in doing that, he's saying, God, I trust you. What you said that you're going to do for me, you're going to do. And I'm just going to trust that it's going to happen when it's going to happen. And, and for Sarah, it was a little bit harder, right? Because she's looking at the reality of what her situation is. And there's a big difference that I want to point out between reality and truth. And it was something that um, a, a great teacher friend of mine said once, um, He's a, a minister in Costa Rica, and he said, reality can change, but truth cannot. The truth of something cannot. So our realities can change. The reality that we're living in, our circumstances, all those things can change, but truth does not. And so Sarah's looking at her reality and saying, yeah, that's not happening. But God's truth is the one that comes to her and says, is there something so difficult for God? Why are you laughing? God said that he would do it. And what he says that he will do, he will do, right? And so we come to this moment where um, some time has passed and Abraham and Lot have separated. Lot goes his way and Abraham goes his way, right? And all of a sudden, um, these but men- Mickey, what calls my attention is the role that Sarah had to play in, or, in order for God's um, word be fulfilled. She had a part, to, she had a part to play. That's very important because God can say a lot of things about us. If we don't believe it, if we don't walk with that word, nothing is going to happen. And Until you know what's interesting? To do that. You know what's interesting in you saying that is that in that culture, women were put aside. Women were not given equal status as a man. And that's why when the man comes to when the man comes to Abraham, he says, "Where's Sarah?" Because she wasn't there with them when they were speaking or anything. Where's Sarah? Oh, she's in the tent. And for me, that points out the fact that God sees us, even when men don't see us as women, or in any situation, in any situation that we find ourselves where we feel like we are the unseen, or we feel like we have been put in a place where we don't matter or don't have status. That does not factor in with God. So in his perfect plan, Sarah was part of it. Have you wondered why three men? There were three different jobs to be done. Mm. One was the spokesperson on behalf of God. That's why he sometimes is the angel of the Lord. Sometimes it's Yehovah speaking because uh, uh, when you're an ambassador for God, yes. Shalia, 
it's like if God's speaking, then another angel had to go and take Lot and his family out of the city. And the third angel had to bring the judgment. So it was a group effort. It was a team effort. Yes. It's mission. <laughs> so they're on a mission from God. And it's interesting because if we keep going down in verse 17, it says, then the Lord said, should I keep the secret from Abraham of what I'm about to do? So they were on a mission and their first stop was Abraham, but their second stop was going on to Lot. And he says, seeing that Abraham will most certainly become a great and mighty nation and in him, in him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed for I have made myself known to him so that he will command his sons and his household after him to keep the way of Adonai by doing righteousness and justice so that Adonai, Adonai may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. So God lets him in on what's going on. And he says, listen, what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah has become their sin is great and i can't uh, take rebecca it i'm sorry before that when god speaks on behalf of uh, uh of abraham how you know he's gonna carry on my words he's gonna teach others about me and we find out later on of all the mistakes that he made i mean very big mistakes we can call them mistakes in spite of that, God saw in him something that was really important. And it's like we're in the process, God is our story is still being written. Yeah. You know, and uh, there are things ahead of us um, that may be mistakes or maybe great things that the Lord has for us. And God works with us every moment. Him from working with us in it, in us. Yes, yes, absolutely. So so God says, um, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and see, indeed, and their sin, sin is very grievous indeed. And he, he says, I'm going to go down and I'm just going to wipe them out, you know? And you read other places in scripture where it says, until the fulfillment of their, their wickedness has been, like, God, in other words, God, if you remember with Noah, where he says, you know, when, when their wickedness gets to a certain point, then God's like, I can't take it anymore. I have to do away with this. There's no coming back from this, right? And so he says, it's too much, right? Rebecca, I, it also made me think it's true, but good or for bad. When Cornelius is praying, he was a, a, a proselyte. He was a, a just man before God. He was a centurion. He would never, ever be able to go to Jerusalem to pray. So he did it in his house. He taught his household about the God of Israel. And he's been doing that for a while, giving, um, uh, meeting the needs of the poor, especially the Jewish people in his, uh, in Caesarea. Um, but that one day was the time when God visited him because he had been doing this for so long until it filled up the, the whatever it is that God has, I have to be present in this man's life. Like if it is in the negative sense also, you know, he can take it for so long. He but gives us there chances. Has be, yes, yes. He gives us chances. And so what we see is that he gives chances, but it gets to the point where he's like, okay, I have to make a determination and I'm going to wipe them out. And what's interesting is that Abraham comes to him and he begins to bargain with God. And if you've ever been to Israel or any of the Middle East Eastern countries, you know that bargaining is a very big in their culture. I'm not good at it at all. It's I don't expected. Like it. <laughs> it's expected. Exactly. It's expected. So, so some of us might have thought like, wow, who does Abraham think he is, you know, coming in and talking to God like this when God has already said what he's going to do. But it was part of their culture. It was a natural thing for him to kind of come and do it. And so he begins going back and forth. He's like, oh, are you going to do it if there's righteous people? Well, how about if there's 50? You know, how about if there's 40? How about, and he keeps, and he keeps pressing him. And God is not intimidated. God is not bothered by it. God keeps it going, you know? And, and he goes, well, but he doesn't find for 50 and he doesn't find 40 and he doesn't. So he keeps going down 20 and, and whatever. And, um, and he says, well, will you do it for 10? At least 10? You know, and, and God says, no, for 10, I won't destroy it. But when he goes out, um, he only finds Lot's family. And the only reason why God does not destroy Lot is because of Abraham. 
Abraham's intervention, right? And we come to a part of the story that is, is really um, unpleasant and, and some might even say controversial um, and some are bothered by what happens here, right? Because it says that the two angels come down um, to Sodom in the evening while Lot is sitting at the gate of Sodom. So we have, again, you know, the person is sitting there kind of waiting and the, the sojourner is passing by. And when Lot saw them, he got up to meet them, which, which is a practice that is practiced there. He learned it from Abraham. Hospitality is a big thing. And he bowed down with his face to the ground. And he says, come into my house, spend the night and wash your feet. And you can get up early and go on your way. Um, and they say, no, we're going to spend our night in the open plaza, knowing full well that that was not a good idea, right? But it's to prove a point. And he says, no, 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 I really, you can't. And he says, it, he urged them strongly, come into my house. And he prepares a feast for them and bakes matzah, right? And they ate. And all of a sudden, it says all of the men of Sodom surrounded the house from the young to the elderly, all of them without exception. And they call out and they say, hey, where are those men that came to your house tonight? Bring them out so that we can have relations with them. This version says we can have relations with them. Some other versions say so that we can know them. And so some of the interpre interpretations are, are that, that Lot was just being kind of selfish and wanted to keep them all to himself and, and, and did not want to let the other men of the town practice hospitality, which was such a big thing in that town. But this translation is correct when it says, um, so that we can have relations with them, so that we can know them, it was in the quote unquote biblical sense, right? And he's and and he starts pleading with them, and he says, "Please, you know, don't do this wicked thing. They're they're under my protection. I've taken them into my house. Don't do this. Look, I have two daughters who have who haven't been intimate with a man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever is good in your eyes. However, don't do anything to these men. And this is a." hard, hard scripture to read. Because we're just coming from a man who places such emphasis on hospitality and on, on trusting God, on, on you know, trying to follow what God wants and, and coming from somebody who has, who has eaten with this person, who has lived with this person, who has learned from this person, as you were saying before, is their elder, you know? They kind of teach us the way, what we're supposed to do. And he completely goes the opposite way and Rebecca, says, uh, you mentioned before, well, to me, that the word to know whatever it is in, in uh, Hebrew is the same word that is used when Isaac is with uh, Rebecca. Well, no, that, that's another word. But this is the word that's used when Ab uh, Adam knows his wife in the beginning. Oh. Yes, this word, is, you know, to know. Oh, it's, it's with to, Ishmael. Yeah, yes. that's the other one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Is to know your is to, to yes. have intimate relations with the person. Yes, so this definitely. this version of the Bible that I have actually correctly translates it and lets us know exactly what they wanted to do. And it wasn't to sit around and talk stories about their life and get to know each other. It was to violate them, right? And for it's such a hard passage to read because you're like, how could Lot place his daughters in such a predicament and How in that culture Lot... in that culture getting married and having children it was very very important it, and it, virginity it, was important it, it, it's just i can i cannot understand what is happening here but i can understand later on because he said this foreigner is trying that the man of the city is this foreigner is trying to tell us what to do. So it means that uh, when Lot decided to go into that city, being part of the community was extremely important uh, because being part of the community meant that yeah you watch uh, watch each other's back, and he, he was very rich Lot. And being part of it was very important. And for whatever reason, I don't know how long it's been since he got there, but he said he, they still call him the foreigner. So I yes. think he was trying to get in good terms with them. You take my daughters, like. It, goes with it, it, it says, yeah, because in, in verse nine, it says, get out of the way they said it. And they said, this one came as an outsider and dares mm -hmm. to judge. 
now we'll treat you worse than them. And so they, they, they kind of want to break the door down. And for me, this is the epitome of the difference between a person who chooses to come into relationship with God, who chooses to come into covenant with God and, and, and to live a certain way and live by the standards that God places and a person who knows of God and can go through the motions, right, of doing things, but allows their own interpretation and their own way of thinking and thinking that they know better than God to get in the way to do something. I can see where you're going, Rebecca, because we have the example of uh, Abraham's hospitality. And Lot is doing the same thing, apparently, but the motives are different. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, uh, the, not only that the motives are different, but when we choose not to place God first and to do things the way God intends us for us to do them, but to think that our understanding is greater than God or that we know better than God or that we can do things on our own and allow our own interpretations to take over and do things. So instead of Lot saying like, no, you can't do this thing, his job was to protect not only the foreigner, but his family that was within his house completely. Mm -hmm. It was for him to take care of them. He was supposed to guard over them. That was his job. And yet he chooses to place his status of, of other people and his position in the city above others, you know, and, and, and to put that all aside. So for me, it's really hard to hear this happen. And we find out later on the result of this happening is that he doesn't respect his family and doesn't place his family in the correct place where it should be and treat them the way they should be. So his family does not respect him and put him in the place where he should be. And we find out a little while later that his instead of his daughters being raped, his ra his daughters rape him. What I what I the Bible doesn't say, but just imagine in that culture Even in our culture, if our father was to do that to us, the, the lack of support and love, the Bible doesn't say, but I, I can only imagine how they felt betrayed, that they were worth nothing to, his, to their father. And that's going to play a role later on what you say. That's why I think they and did what they did. And not only that they're worth nothing and 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 are betrayed, but they they also feel the um, the desolation of seeing what has just happened to the city. Right, this is the first time we have mention of something like this happening, and and the the response that the daughters have is of desperation in a sense. Where in verse thirty one it says, "Then the firstborn said to the younger." Our father is old and there is no man in the land to come to us as is the custom of the whole land. So for them, what they have just witnessed, which has never before been witnessed, right? God sending down, completely wiping out the town. And remember that- They thought it was not, the whole world. They thought it was, it was the, whole, the world. whole world. Because mm -hmm. if you'll remember, you know, for us, it's so, it's so easy. We live in towns and we, and, and there's like no, not even a separation, right? You were, I know that, for example, where my uncle lives, which is about 10 minutes away, he lives on a town where the street that he lives on, one side of it is one town and the other side is another town. There's no separate. It's like right there, right? We have one town after the other. It wasn't like that in those times. And so when they see this happen, they're like, oh my God, you know, we're destroyed. You know, th 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 what are we going to do? We don't have um, an answer for this how are we going to live how are we going to how are we going to continue on because um lineage and procreation is embedded in us from 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 the moment we were created with adam and eve right that's the first thing that god tells us to do is to uh, be fruitful and multiply that is ingrained in us and they see this as detrimental that it's never going to happen for them and and very much similarly like with sarah that had not been able to have a child to be able to have children and procreate was a huge part of their culture as a woman. Their status was less, less than a man. You know, they, they were, they, if ever there was a time in history where a woman was 
supposed to be barefoot and pregnant, you know, this would be the time where that would fit perfectly in the kitchen, you know, and, and pregnant or whatever. This was their calling that they felt. And now it's been taken away from them by something that they cannot explain or understand. And as a result of the betrayal that Lot has had with them, they come up with this crazy idea of, well, let's sleep with him and then we'll have kids. You know, then Rebecca, we'll be able to continue. I would like to mention, I meet on Mondays with, I am, I was born and raised in Costa Rica. So I was able to reconnect with some high school friends and we decided to study the Bible together, the eight of us. And one in the group, they're new in the Lord. One in the group had a daughter-in-law who's unable to uh, get pregnant. So we've been together for a year and she has asked the Lord for so long, especially when it comes Mother's Day, you know, like she has like four, four sons and they're all married and they have kids that she always cries uh, because she's not able to bear children. Well, she gave us a, a great news last week because they're, they're going through a fertility treatment and my friend said, I was hoping that God would do it naturally. But yeah, hey, if she's able to carry a baby, that'll be, you know, that'll be fine. And, and the creativity of God, because when, when Yeshua was on, on the earth, he healed people just by saying the word, go back to the priests, you know, to the lepers. Or he put mud in somebody else's eyes. It, it, the creativity of God, you know, the, the way he works with us is, but the concept of being a mother is very important. I wonder if the people that are connected today know of someone or themselves are going through this um, period of not being able to conceive. And this is a great example of God, what God can do. You know, God is the God of the impossible, like he did with Sarah. Amen. Amen. And so what we're looking at is, is the dysfunction of what can happen in families when God is not at the center. When we allow our own thinking to think that we can outwit God or that we know better and that our plans are better, how quickly things can go sideways. You know, um, I know that, that when I was reading in the book of Judges, where it says, you know, and everyone, every man did as what he thought best. And the result of that was that they were constantly straying away from God. God had established things and they would constantly stray. And because of their straying, they would begin to practice things that God had never intended for them to practice ever. It wasn't in his plan for them. They had a, a different calling, a different direction that they were supposed to go in. And so I think this is just a wake up call for us to recognize that when we make a commitment and we decide to follow God, we have to stand with that no matter what. Because no matter what, it very well could have been that Lot could have lost his life that day if he had decided to fight for his daughters. You know, the, the stakes were really, really high. But we have to determine whether those stakes are worth it or not. If God is worth it, if, if it's worth trusting God, and the, the resounding answer to that question, without a doubt, is yes. No matter what, God is faithful to care for us and to be there for us. And God is faithful to do what he says he will do in our life if we will just stand, right? If we will just stand. Now, one of the things that um, really impacted me as I can, like I said, this passage is so full of, of so many things. but um, one of the things that I wanted to touch on was the fact that um, Abraham's actions and the way he goes through life was a process that he went through with God. And it took time for him to go through this process, right? To walk with him to the point where God says, I can make a covenant with this guy. I know who he is, right? It tells us before that it says, you know, I know that he's going to teach his sons and his daughters my ways. I know that he's going to teach them, you know, the, the lifestyle that I want them to have so that my purpose can be fulfilled in them, right? And if we jump ahead, um, 
we're just going to touch on it for a couple of minutes because there's a lot that we could talk about but uh, we come to the point of the birth of isaac where god's fulfillment comes to pass and it says that that just like the man had said to, to abraham in the, at his tent sarah gives birth to a child and she has him but we have to remember that abraham already has a son because of sarah that is not of sarah right and his name is ishmael and you alluded to it before a, li a little bit but it says that um becky uh before that or yes. rebecca uh um, chapter 20 uh abraham and abimelech you know that that, that when uh, a situation arises that he said uh, sarah is my sister which was half true and um, the king takes her in to his palace um that was a very bad choice that he made abraham and it makes me think that in the scope of his lifespan one incident or two whenever we make mistakes that does not define us that we can grow from there you know and um, that's what i see you know uh, mm. move on and and yes yes well well and and i mean i was gonna jump over it but what you're saying with with abraham he chooses to live to save his own skin yes he kind of took a little bit of lot with him. <laughs> even though he's trying not to but he takes a little bit of lot with him and he, for his own purposes he says listen say that you're my sister so that they don't kill me you know um and and the result of of that is that he has problems with Abimelech, but God intervenes. You know, God intervenes. And and because Abimelech listens to, to God, they're able to move on from this because God's purpose, if Sarah would have um, been with Abimelech, then the plan that God had with Abraham would have ended right there. And that did not fit into the plan that God had already established. So they move on at, from that situation and comes time for um, Sarah to give birth to this baby that was promised to her, right? Rebecca, I so I see uh, that that when God has a certain direction, even though we may take a detour, his plan for us will be fulfilled. Somehow, um, he will bring us back to his yes. path. And that's very yeah. important. Um, so it says that um, she gives birth and, and they name the baby Laughter. And this name, Laughter, is going to play out throughout his story. The root word for this word, Laughter, is going to play out in this story. And because a little while later, if you'll remember, Abraham already has a son, like I was mentioning before, right? Ishmael. And it was because of a decision that Sarah made. So God is working, like you're saying, God is working with all of these kind of things that, you know, that that um, God has a plan and Abraham says, okay, I'm going to follow this plan. But then Abraham kind of sticks his hand in the mix. Sarah mixes, sticks her hand in the mix. And we have these situations that arise. So God is going this way and he's having to deal with all of these things that have been added because of decisions that Abraham and Sarah make. And one of those decisions was for Sarah to give her maidservant to Abraham so that she could have a child through the maidservant. And Ishmael is there. And it says um, in verse eight of chapter 21, the child grew and was weaned. Abraham made a big feast on the day Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham. My version, my, my Bible version says making fun mocking says here mocking and some and some i've seen that it says scoffing and and the reality is is that that word comes from the same root word as laughter laughing but the connotation that it has is of a sexual nature of an intimate nature and that same word is used later on when you're reading years ahead isaac has grown up and he's with rebecca and it says that the servant saw them and that they were um, playing or fooling around, it's the same word. In other words, they were 
they were involved in activities that only a married couple would be involved in. So what does that tell us here for this passage? The reason that Sarah uh, wants to eject Hagar and Ishmael out of the camp was not simply just because she was jealous or because she wanted um, Isaac to have everything and didn't want Abraham, uh, Ishmael to get anything, but because Ishmael is mistreating Isaac in a very particular way. In other well, words, he, he was 13 when Abraham was 99. He had been circumcised. Well, time goes on and the child grew. So Ishmael, I don't know how old was he, but he was much older. So he right. knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what he was doing, but what he was doing was he was molesting mm -hmm. Isaac. And when Sarah sees that, she says, oh, no. So sometimes we give Sarah a little bit of a bad rap because we say, oh, you know, she's the one who brought this on herself and she's the one who made the decision and she, you know, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, if you look at it from that point of view, how many of us would have been Sarah at that moment if we see something like this happening to our child? And, and I don't know about you, but some of us who have a little bit more of a spicier personality may not have just wanted to, to toss him out, may have wanted to do something worse. And we would have felt justified in taking care of our child because of what we see happening, right? And so when she says, um, drive out this female slave, and it hurts Abraham because Ishmael, although Ishmael went through the process of adoption that they had in, in Middle Eastern culture where, where Sarah kind of adopted him as her own, during that time, it's really not hers. And you can see that it's not hers, especially now that she has Isaac, this one is hers. But for Abraham, it says that Abraham, it displeased Abraham because it is his. And as a father, even when your child does something wrong, you never wanna see something bad happen to your child, right? You never wanna see, and, and when I say bad, the reason why I say bad is because to be expelled from the camp was in essence a death sentence because again I want to bring up the fact that we have towns that are literally right up against each other right here but at that time you had camps and you had wilderness you had camps and you had desert you had camps and you had isolation you know and so to be cast out of the camp to be cast out of the group you were exposed to the elements, to people who didn't have good intentions, to becoming a slave yourself some, for somebody else, to dying, to et cetera, et cetera. In other words, your life was hanging in the balance. And when Abraham sees that this is what's going to happen to his child, his heart of a father is touched, right? Well, remember when, when um, Sarah gives um, Hagar to Abraham to have a child, as soon as she got pregnant, Hagar took a different, uh, she forgot her place yes. Yes. in her family. So and that grieved Sarah. So there's a lot of things in this story. A lot of tension. Where, yeah. Yes. A yes, lot of unspoken family. tension. Definitely. Yes. And I think this was like the straw that broke the camel's back. This was, this what could not be overlooked. This was not something that Sarah was going to let stand. So Abraham is displeased in his heart. And God, once again, has to intervene. And God says, listen to what she's saying. Let it happen. You know, just do it. And we have everything that happens, you know, with them. And we're not going to go into it because I think our time is running out. But I just want to, to bring this up because sometimes I think we, we give Sarah a bad rap. And, and granted, Sarah was fully responsible for Ishmael and Hagar even being in those positions because of the choice that she made. But I think with understanding the, the concept of the, the root of this word of what it actually means, you can understand her indignation, you can understand her anger, and you can understand her decision for wanting to, ca to cast him out, right? And so maybe we can give her a little slack this week <laughs> on, on what, how we, we see her to be. And there's one last thing that I want to touch on, and I'm really just glossing over it, but I one last thing that I want to touch on, and because obviously this 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 Torah portion, like I said, was so meaty and, and so full of information that we have the famous passage of the binding of of Isaac, the Agada, the Akada, right? The Akada, see. Akada of Isaac. 
And, and I know that we've spoken about it a lot of times and everything, but the one thing that I want to point out is, the, is this. When it comes to um, this situation, it says after all of these things, the, the passage, this portion of this passage, part of this portion starts out by saying, now it was after these things, after all these things have happened that we just, you know, mentioned that God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and, and Abraham says, Hineni. And the word Hineni is here I am. But not only is it here I am, Hineni, in essence, what it means is my answer is yes, but, or before you even tell me what it is. Whatever it is that you're telling me that I have to do, my answer is yes. So it shows Abraham's commitment, right? And so we've seen how the, the journey of Abraham, has got, his, his, his strengthening of his relationship with, between God has gotten stronger and stronger, and he has become to rely on God more and more and more. And it comes to a point where God says, I'm going to test him. And, and in essence, we're going to see that I don't think that is that God tests him for God to know. It's for God to test Abraham so Abraham can know where he stands. Right. So he answers Hineni, but he doesn't know what's going to happen. But in essence, he's already said, whatever it is that you tell me to do, God, I'm going to say yes to it. Right. And so God's answer to that is, OK, great. Well, if you're going to do everything that um, anything that I say to do, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains about which I will tell you. And here's the little nugget that I just want us to take away with this. And the nugget that I want to take away with this is that a burnt offering was one where the offering was burnt up completely before God. With other offerings, when we get into Leviticus and, and the other books of, of the Bible later on, when God kind of stipulates and, and kind of lays out the way of life that he wants for his people and the way he wants things to run in the temple and with sacrifices and everything, you'll find out that there's different types of offerings. But the burnt offering was one that had to be burnt up completely. And what it emphasized or what it brought up was the full commitment that was given to God. Other offerings, part of it was given to the priest for them to eat or part of it yeah. you were supposed to eat with those around you. You know, there were things that, that you partook of a meal with that offering. This one wasn't the case. This one, everything was burnt up to God and so in essence what God is saying is listen I want you to take your son and I want you to give him fully to me and Abraham's answer before he knew what it was is in Amy here I am may I read uh, verse four sure it says on the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance he said to his servants stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there we will worship and then we will come back to you. He understood what God was asking of him. But he was also sure that somehow he would come back with Isaac. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so when and, and you can read through it and I know that we've, you know, in, in other teachings, we've talked about the whole process of everything that goes on and everything. But the one thing that stood out to me was through this through this process we've seen the role that hospitality plays out and and, in, and when i say hospitality hospitality what i mean is is a way of life and a culture that abraham is creating in this journey with god he's going to behave a certain way and he messes up we see several instances where he messes up in this passage we see him mess up with abimelech and telling sarah to say that you know, it's his sister that he doesn't get killed or have something happen to him. He messes up. But through this process, he is creating a culture or a lifestyle where he places God at the center. And for me, that's what stood out in this portion. It comes to the point where he's creating this culture. He's learning. He's walking. He's living. He's making mistakes. He gets up again. He keeps walking to get to the point where God says, all right, I'm going to test you to see if everything that you've been learning if it's really in here or if you're just going through the motions, because the problem with going through the motions is that you can very well end up like Lot. 
where you can go through the motions and show hospitality and everything, but your your actions are really self-serving and you don't factor God into the equation. Where on the other hand, Abraham says, no, God, you're at the center. And it gets to the point where God, you're so much at the center that when you call on me, whatever it is that you say that I should do, I'm going to do. I would like to finish off with the, uh, when um, Isaac is concerned in verse, um, I read better without my glasses. Where he says, <laughs> the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Well, what happens if you see uh, verse 13 says, well, he goes through the process. He's about to kill Isaac. And uh, when, they, when God says, stop, don't do it. I know that I can trust you. It says in verse 13, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a lamb caught, a ram caught by its horns. In other words, when we have a need, God already had the provision. The ram had been there all along. Abraham couldn't see it because he was hidden. Just when we ask, when we come before the Lord in our hearts or in our prayers and we're expecting an answer, the answer is right there. The fact that we don't see it immediately doesn't mean that God hasn't answered. It means that in due time, God will do it. Amen. Amen. And so I hope that that's an encouragement for all of us today, you know, that it may be that we're on a journey where we're learning. And like a child that's learning to walk, we walk, we fall down, we walk, we fall down, we walk, we fall down, we get up and we keep going and strengthening and maturing in God to the point where we can be the ones to say, Hineni. it could be that there's something deep in our hearts, a desire, a want, a, a, a need that needs to be fulfilled. And in God's timing, if it's part of what his plan is with the conviction that what God wants for me is good and he wants the best for me. And if we think about ourselves with um, our own children, right? In that passage, I believe it's in Matthew where it says, who if your child is, is, is hungry, you're gonna give him a stone. You're not gonna do that. Or if he says this, you're gonna give him a snake. You know, you're not gonna do that. You wanna give them the best of, of, of what you can, right? How much more our father, right? So with that conviction of knowing that he wants the best, that he has his best intentions for me. And if it's in his will, it will come to pass no matter what. May this be an encouragement for Amen. us. May this be an encouragement for us. And may it be an encouragement for us to keep walking with him. Because in doing so, we will see the hand of God work in mighty, mighty ways. Amen? Amen. And so I think we've given a lot to think about, a lot to kind of chew on. It was a meaty portion, but I hope that you were able to receive something. And just like Brenda Lee says, he is a good, good father. And let us always remember yes, that. Amen. 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 Shabbat so shalom. I'm, Shabbat shalom. So we're going to stop the recording here so that um, we can get on, on our after party. And, and I want to encourage